Scripture this morning is Genesis 49, 33 through 50, 14. <clears throat> when Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it. For that is how many, for that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him seventy days. And when the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I am about to die in the tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan. There shall you bury me. Now, therefore, let me please go up and bury my father, then I will return. And Pharaoh answered, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father. With him went up all the servants of Joseph, of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both ch chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. When they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and grievous lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. When the, when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is gr a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore, the place was named Abba Mizraim. It is beyond the Jordan. Thus his sons did for him as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron, the Hittite, to possess as a burying place. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. You may be seated. blessing to be with you today. We do have a nice crowd. Appreciate your attendance and do appreciate everyone who's watching at home on YouTube. Uh, just a quick note that tonight's sermon is going to be both places. It'll be on our YouTube channel and it will also be on the Facebook channel starting at six o'clock. So whichever platform, format, app, whatever you prefer to use, whatever works best on your device, these words have never been spoken from a pulpit before, have they? Man, oh, we got a whole new vernacular with this technology thing going on. Watch the sermon tonight. Uh, I thought it was pretty good myself. <laughs> and you thought Stuart and uh, Alton were nervous this morning about Kirk being late. When he's late next Sunday, you're going to be really nervous because he's preaching. So. Uh, if he's not here by 10:15, Stuart, you better work something up real quick. Well, this morning we wrap up our sermon series on the life of Joseph. Uh, I think we have a pretty good handle on the Joseph story, and maybe we've always had a pretty good handle on, on the facts of the story. But I hope that over the course of the last 12 weeks, we've gone deeper than just the facts to kind of see what God's up to, that God has always worked and he's still working through people like Joseph and through people like you and people like me. Last week, you remember, we ended with Joseph's promise to Jacob that when dad passes, the sons would carry his bones back to Canaan for burial. And in chapter 48, we first read the story of Jacob's blessing his grand boys, the sons of Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim. And one theme that kind of runs through the patriarchal story 
is that of the other son, the lesser son, receiving the covenant blessing. It's not Ishmael, it's Isaac. It's not Esau, it's Jacob. It's not Reuben, the firstborn of Leah, it's Joseph, the firstborn of Rachel. And so now these two grandsons come before Jacob. Manasseh's the oldest, we expect him to get the blessing, and Joseph expects that too. He purposely places Manasseh at Joseph's right hand to receive the greater blessing. He places his other son Ephraim on his left hand. But surprise, Jacob crosses his hands. And Joseph says, Dad, what are you doing? I know you can't see very well, but Manasseh is at your right hand. And Jacob says, Son, I know what I'm doing. And you're reading this week, especially in that Jeremiah passage, chapter 31, you saw a constant reference to Ephraim. He comes to represent the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom is almost always referred to as Judah. And all of that comes from these two chapters, chapters 48 and 49, as these blessings are issued to all the sons. Now Judah has really come on in the last few weeks, hasn't he? He's kind of established himself as the leader among the 11 brothers. And that's the hand of God at work. The royal line of Israel will emerge through the tribe of Judah, beginning with King David and extending all the way to Jesus. And so in a nutshell, we're not going to read it today, but that's chapters 48 and 49. And as Brother Frank just read to us in chapter 50, Jacob passes away. The text says he's gathered to his people. I like that. Folks, one day you and I will be gathered to our people the people of God, together in the presence of Jesus. Jacob is embalmed. That's a little bit of a surprise, but he's in Egypt. And I guess when you're in Egypt, you do as the Egyptians do, and they're really good at embalming. You can go to pretty much any museum of anthropology, and the good ones all have an Egyptian mummy that you can look at. The one I saw in Los Angeles had, had it sectioned off so you could look at his insides. It was pretty gross, actually. And they leave Jacob in the embalming fluid for 40 days because that's their custom. And then that is followed by 30 more days of mourning. And when the 70 days are complete, the sons then pack up the wagon with dad's body and they head for the cave of Machpelah, which is up near Hebron. The funeral procession, we're told, is lengthy. All of Israel's descendants go back for the funeral, but also all the servants of Pharaoh, all of Pharaoh's elders, and at least some of the Egyptian military. There is a convoy of chariots and horsemen, Frank read to us. Now, you remember that back in the good old days, you don't see it much anymore. When we saw a funeral procession coming and we're driving our car, what do we do? We pull off the road. And I've seen people in the old days who would get out and take their hat off and put it over their heart, a sign of respect for all those people who are grieving. And if you wanted to know how well-loved the deceased was, it depended on how long it took for that procession to get by your car. Jacob was well-loved and respected by both the Hebrew people and the Egyptian people. And I think it's interesting that the Egyptian military leads Israel back to Canaan. Now, something else I find interesting. I want you to look at this map here. This is a map depicting Goshen and Hebron. That seems like, man, that's a straight shot right along the Mediterranean Sea. Shouldn't take that long to get there. But interestingly, the text tells us that this funeral procession makes a detour. They swing way to the right, beyond the Jordan. Scholars think they took a route that looks something like this. And folks, that's an odd route to take. Why in the world would they do that? Why would they go out of their way to wander through the desert east of the Dead Sea and enter Canaan to the north across the Jordan River to reach their destination? See, I can only think of one answer to that question. 
this is the will of God. That God here is offering a glimpse of a similar route that Jacob's descendants will take in another 500 years or so. The route of the Exodus under Moses and ultimately under Joshua as God once again leads his people back to the promised land. But note that on that particular occasion, they won't be led by the Egyptian army. They'll be chased by the Egyptian army. Well, the sons of Israel laid dad's body in the cave of Machpelah, where Abraham and Sarah's remains are already resting, also the remains of Isaac and Rebekah, and the remains of Jacob's first wife, Leah. You'll remember that Rachel is not buried in that cave. After she dies, giving birth to Benjamin, she's buried somewhere along the road between Bethel and Bethlehem. They have the funeral, they bury the bones, and then everybody loads up and heads back to Goshen. And that's where we pick up now, Genesis chapter 50, beginning in verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came down and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. The sins of your youth they ever keep you up at night. You lie in bed thinking about all the stupid, crazy, sinful things you did maybe 40, 50 years ago. And you wonder how in the world is God's grace going to cover that? that sexual encounter, that abortion, that adultery, that divorce. Maybe it was something you did that was dishonest. Maybe you cheated somebody out of something. Maybe it's something that only you and God know about, but if God knows, well, that's really the only person that matters. And you read Verses like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, where Paul says to the church, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. And we think, yeah, yeah. That sounds too good to be true. And maybe we even doubt it. Too good to be true. See, that's kind of where the 11 brothers find themselves after they get back from the funeral. One of them says, you know, dad's dead. There's nothing stopping Joseph now for taking revenge on all of us. He can kill us all. He's got that power. If he wants to, he can have our head on a sharp stick by the end of the day. Now, all of us would say, hold on a minute. Joseph has already forgiven you for that. He's treated you well. He even said, don't be stressed out over all of this. This is the second time he tells them that this is God's doing, that God brought me here. It is his will that I would bring my people to this land to be taken care of through this famine. This is a God thing. It's not about you. But to the brothers, well, it just seems too good to be true. 
Now, maybe Jacob really did say to the brothers, after I'm gone, you go tell Joseph that I said he needs to forgive you. You tell him I said so. Maybe Jacob did. I'd rather think these brothers made all that up. Joseph's already forgiven them. Joseph has saved them from the famine. He has shown them again and again and again how much he loves them. But all of it just seems too good to be true. Quite often in a sermon I will ask you, which character of the text do you most relate? And as much as I hate to break the news to you, all of us, we're the brothers. And while Joseph is by no means perfect or divine or sovereign, in this story, he kind of represents God. He treats them as God would. We talked in Wednesday night Bible class about how, how Joseph is a type or a glimpse or a shadow of Jesus. And Joseph chooses to give his brothers grace. A grace that seems too good to be true. And so I'd like to draw a little bit of a comparison, and I'll admit it's a loose comparison because uh, we're going to have to uh, kind of pretend that we are Joseph's brothers, that, that really we're all humankind. And to make the comparison work, we need to see Joseph as something of a godly figure. And he does act like God. Why? Because he knows he's created in God's image. He is meant to bear the image of God. And church, so are you and I. And so here's the first point. Like Joseph's brothers, people are dead in their sins. These brothers are certainly not Joseph's allies, are they? They plotted to kill him and ended up selling him down the river. They have sinned against Joseph, and they deserve to be killed for what they've done. And brothers and sisters of the faith, everybody in the room this morning and everyone watching online is in the very same boat. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians 2, beginning in the first verse. He says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like all of mankind. See, here's the deal. Everybody needs to get that message first. Scripture does not declare sinners to be sick. Scripture pronounces sinners dead. And our ability to grasp that will determine whether or not we receive grace. Sinners are DOA, dead on arrival. Now, Satan in the world will tell us otherwise. You're not dead. You're just, you're just sick. We can fix you. We'll educate you. We'll counsel you. We'll give you a government check. We will stick you in a program or some new age religion. And after a few tweaks, you'll be fine. Here's the truth. The world cannot fix dead people. And common sense tells us that dead people cannot fix themselves. Sinners are dead meat. And I know that sounds harsh. The church, the word needs to be preached. Scripture says that all of us are sinners. Sinners deserving death. That's a dilemma. What can be done to fix it? Well, point number two, like the brothers of Joseph, people need mercy, love, and grace from a higher power. The brothers got that from Joseph. He sees his brothers standing in line for food, he has the power to have them killed. These Hebrews are nothing but a bunch of spies. Kill them all. Joseph doesn't do that. He doesn't give them what they deserve. And that's the very definition of mercy. Well, why doesn't he? Because he loves them. 
Instead of giving his brothers what they deserve, he gives them what they most certainly do not deserve. And that is the very definition of grace. Instead of killing them on the spot, he gives them food, refunds their money. Mercy, love, and grace. That's what dead sinners need. We continue in Ephesians 2 where Paul writes this, but God being rich in what? Mercy because of his what? Great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Church family, that is the difference between Christianity and every other world religion or philosophy. Christianity is not about a sick person getting better. It's about a dead person coming back to life. And that's where my comparison breaks down. Because point number three, like Joseph's brothers, people don't need resuscitation. They need resurrection. And that can only happen in Christ Jesus. Paul says that only in Jesus are we who are dead brought back to life. The sins of Joseph's brothers have to be paid for. But Joseph can't pay that price because he too is a sinner. The price for the brothers' sins and Joseph's sins was paid by Jesus. Sin must be paid for. God's wrath against sin must be appeased. God is holy. God is just. And he cannot compromise his justice. But God is also loving. And he cannot diminish his mercy. And so we have this great paradox, a mystery for the ages. How can God be both just and merciful without compromising one or the other? And the answer is Jesus. Let's read on in Ephesians 2. Paul says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. And God raised us up with Jesus. Jesus is the only answer for sinful humanity. But here's the deal. To bring us to life, Jesus had to be put to death. The very definition of sin is us putting ourselves in a place only God belongs. That's sin. But the very definition of grace is God putting himself where we deserve to be. And only at the cross could God give deliverance and justice to all people. Look at Romans chapter 3 with me. Verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified, put right, by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, a sacrifice of atonement by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier, the one who puts right, the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It's excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No. But by a law of faith. See, it takes something radical to bring a dead person back to life. And folks, there's nothing more radical than this. The judge was judged in our place. 
Jesus came as a man born under law, and in his life he perfectly kept the law. And in his death, he perfectly satisfied the demand of the law that says all sinners must die. He took our place. He paid our debt. And Paul asked, can we boast that we've done anything to be accepted by God? No. What could we do? We were dead. Our resurrection in Christ is all grace. Dead people can't do anything. And guess what? God didn't have to do anything. He didn't have to. God chose to. And that's why it's called grace. Now, not all people are going to be saved. But because of Jesus, all people are savable. No matter what you've done, no matter what depths you've sunk to, God's grace can save you this morning. Any person is savable because anyone can be made alive in Christ Jesus. And church family and those who might be watching around the globe, that's good news. Really good news. Ephesians 2, 8 again, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not saved by faith, but by grace, through faith. My faith in no way obligates God. We are saved only by His grace through faith. Not because of faith. We're saved because of Jesus. Because of what He did for us at the cross. Our faith is simply the hand that takes the gift. We receive the gift of grace, the gift of salvation in faith. And so the only thing we can boast about is how good God is. I want us to look again at verse 8, this time from the message. It's a paraphrase, but I really like it. Peterson writes, saving is all God's idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. That's grace. A grace that seems too good to be true. When I was in high school, I guess that was about the time that many of the preachers in our brotherhoods stopped preaching hellfire and damnation and started preaching grace and love. And my my mom, she's watching right now, my mom was not too pleased with that. I would bring up the name of a preacher that I really liked and she would say, he's one of those grace and love guys. Church, I'm a grace and love guy. Amen. Because without it, my boat is sunk. I know what I've done. And I know what I deserve. I'll take grace. Well, Joseph's brothers found it difficult to receive the grace. Satan keeps coming back to them. Oh, you're going to get it now. When you get back, they're probably going to have Simeon dead. Oh, Benjamin, they're going to kill him. Now that dad's dead, you're all dead. Maybe Satan likes to whisper in your ear too to remind you of your sin, sin that God has already forgiven and sin that I believe he's forgotten about. We read in our reading this past week, Jeremiah chapter 31 says, I'm going to bring a new covenant, not one written on stone tablets, one that's written on the hearts of people, a covenant whereby people will know me, not just the Jews, but everybody in the whole world, a covenant whereby people's sins are not just going to be forgiven, but their iniquity is going to be forgotten. 
That's the covenant we've been talking about this morning. And it's a covenant of grace. A grace that forgives and forgets and saves. Joseph says, brothers, none of this is about us. This is all God. God's been so good to us and he's working through us. He's dealt with all of us in mercy and love and grace. And I'm going to deal with you the very same way. Not because I have to, but because I've chosen to. Because I love you. So just accept the gift and say thanks. Now, almost everyone in this room and probably most of the folks online this morning are in Christ. And I hope that you are striving to walk with him and become like him. If that's how you live your life, you have grace. God has forgiven your iniquity and he remembers your sin no more. Here's the bad news. If you are not in Christ this morning, none of these promises are for you. But grace always gets the last word. It's not too late. Jesus can fix you too. Die with Jesus. Be raised with Jesus in baptism where all that sin will be washed away, forgiven, forgotten, and in faith, receive the gift of God's grace. A gift that seems too good to be true. Two of our elders are here this morning to pray with you if you'd like to uh, engage in some prayer about anything that might be going on in your life. If there's anyone ready to be baptized, I will be down here at the front to receive you when the